Since posting a recent video on my recent Colorado trail race experience, I've received a plethora of interesting questions about the adventure. And I thought it would be fun to address some of those FAQs all at once, so that's what I'm gonna do today. There's always a lot of curiosity about bike setup and component choices, so I'll get started with those and then we'll see where it goes. By the way, if you're new to this channel, I'm Alan, AKA Dirty Teeth, nice to meet you. What bike did you choose? Any mechanical issues or failures? Good question. I rode a Niner RKT9, Rocket 9, RDO, full suspension bike with a Fox 34 Factory Stepcast Fork and Fox Factory Float Shock. 120 millimeters of travel up front and 100 millimeters in the rear. My bike was comfy, it was efficient, and it performed exactly as I hoped it would. Yes, you can be comfy and happy on the CTR with a hardtail, but the full squish was the right call for me. And yes, the full suspension does make packing a little more complicated, but it's totally doable, and I'll get to those questions soon. I've gotten inquiries about the white spokes, they're made by Bird, and I made a whole video about my wheels, which you can check out if you want. In a nutshell, they're Bird Hawk 27s with Onyx Vesper hubs. I love them, and they were perfect for the CTR. For tires, I chose an older version one Maxxis Forecaster 2.35 in the front, and I went with a Continental Cross King 2.3 in the rear. For sealant, I went with Orange Seal Regular, and I never punctured or had to add any air at all. My saddle of choice is a Brooks C13 Carved. I've now used it on the Iditarod, AZT, and CTR, and it works for me. <laughs> I like this one. Why are your handlebars so thick? <laughs> That's because I built them up with silicone padding and some cushy bar tape. Uh, it's mainly so I can rest my forearms on it and get comfy during the long gravel and pavement detours. It allows me to be a little more aero and efficient and get out of the wind. But it's also nice for extra hand positions during normal riding and as an option to grab for hike -a bike sections. Were you happy with switching to an electronic drivetrain? How did it hold up? If you saw my CTR prep video, then you know I swapped from a mechanical drivetrain to a SRAM Axis wireless system before the CTR. This was mainly to try and alleviate some nerve issues I had in my thumb after riding the AZT300 this spring. Well, I'm super stoked to say I had zero problems with my thumb either during or after the race and the drivetrain in and of itself was flawless. My derailleur battery died on day four and I just swapped it out with my spare, no problem. Other than that, I cleaned my cassette regularly and lubed the chain every day or so and the shifting was never less than perfect. While we're on that topic, I'll try to hit all my electronic questions at once. I used a Garmin Edge 540 for navigation. I charged it at night, either in my hotel room with a flat wall charger or with my Nightcore 10,000 milliamp cache battery, and I never came close to running out of juice. I chose not to use a Dynamo Hub because I move too slow on the CT and the cache batteries are just too good these days. I wore a Wahoo Ticker heart rate monitor to help force keep my pacing slow and conservative. For lights, I used a Phoenix BC26R on the handlebars and an exposure joystick on my helmet. I carried two spare batteries for the Phoenix, which I never used. I use the Phoenix almost exclusively on the second to lowest setting, which easily lasts for a full night of riding, and I'd make sure to charge it up at the hotels. Same for the joystick, it's plenty bright on the lowest setting, easily lasts a whole night of riding. I did carry two Nightcore 10,000 mAh cash batteries in case I chose not to stop at hotels, but I never had to touch the second one. As far as fixing the GPS and light to my handlebar, it was my first time using the Topeak UTF multi-mount and it gets two thumbs up. It's lightweight, it's robust, and it's versatile. The GoPro insert goes a little farther forward than the K-Edge mount that I normally use, so when I use the Phoenix GoPro adapter, it puts my light out far enough from the head tube that I can click it in and out easy and tip it to the desired angle. Then I mounted the Garmin directly above in a tidy streamlined position. I had both units tethered just in case, but everything stayed solid and secure for the whole ride. What equipment did you use to film the ride? This is it right here, just my iPhone 12 mini, same as I did for my Iditarod video. I kept it in my shorts pocket for easy access and left it in airplane mode to help with battery life. What shoes did you wear and did you like them? This is a really popular question because of all the hiking and walking on the CT. In the past, I've had great success with different iterations of the Perlazumi X Alps for this type of route. 
but last year my right foot wasn't happy in my X Alps during training for the CT. I mentioned this to my friend Jay, and he got me to try the Physic Terra Ergole shoes. Actually, let me show them to you. Okay. I haven't looked back, and I've used this same pair on the CTR in 2023, as well as the AZT 300 and the CTR this year. They haven't fallen apart yet, so yeah, I'm pretty happy with them. I think the old school laces spreads pressure more evenly across the top of my foot than even the best BOA systems, and you don't have to worry about a BOA failing. They're super comfy, they have a roomy toe box, and the soles are grippy with a good balance of flex for hiking and stiffness while riding. Enough said. What specifically did you use for rain gear? My jacket is a Mont Bell Torrent Flyer. It's Gore-Tex, weighs only around 200 grams. It packs up well. It has really long pit zips and a nice hood. On my legs, I wore Rab Zenith Gore-Tex rain pants that have full length zips. I can get them on and off over my shoes with ease and there's two zippers, so it's easy to manage sweat and get some airflow. Kinda like pit zips for your legs. In the back pocket of the pants, I keep a couple dog poop bags, which I'll pull over my socks if it gets really bad but I usually just allow my feet to get wet and my Merino socks keep them warm for the most part. For my hands, I carry the Ultralight Z-Pax Virtus Rain Mitts. I love these and I take them everywhere. They pack to nothing, I can quickly throw them over whatever riding gloves I'm using, and even though they're mitts, I can still manage single finger breaking in them. In your recent video, you were wearing a mesh looking head garment. What was the reason for it and do you have a brand you recommend? It's just a generic mesh neck drape that I found on Amazon. It provides great ear and neck protection while the sun is blazing and it's easy to stash away when I don't need it. I'll put a link below. Where did you keep everything? It looks like you're traveling super light with nothing up front. I think it would be interesting to hear how you carried all that food on a full suspension bike. I would like to know how you carry water and how you purify it. Okay, uh, where do I start with these? Uh, although my setup may seem pretty light, I was pretty strategic and I was never lacking. And you're correct about nothing up front, no handlebar bag, no stem bags, nothing mounted on my forks, etc. I hate stuff rattling around on techie descents and I wanted to keep the front nice and light for all the lifting and pushing up and over rocks. I also just wanted a clean and tidy cockpit. But even so, I still had plenty of room for everything, even the extra pizza slices I packed from the Stage Stop Saloon. I made a couple videos after last year's CTR detailing my bags and packing and all that, but the Cliff's Notes version is this. I stuffed my sleep kit and a down hoodie in an Osprey dry bag, which lived in a Wayward Riders Louise seat harness. My rain gear lived in my frame bag for easy access. Uh, I also had some spare socks and knicker length long johns crammed in there. Tucked between my frame bag and top tube was a cheapy plastic emergency poncho, some zip ties, uh, a drivetrain cleaning brush, and the pole for the hoop of my bivy. My spares and repair kit was in a Zephyl Z-Box mounted in a Silka titanium bottle cage on the down tube. My primary multi-tool, chain lube, and a piece of rag were located in a nuclear sunrise jerry can for easy access. I kept my spare batteries, cash batteries, chargers, charging cables, etc. in a waterproof a lock sack bag and stuffed that in the jerry can as well. My JPAX footlong EXT was reserved purely for food and I could stuff quite a lot in there, trust me. I wore a traditional cycling jersey with three large pockets where I could stash all kinds of stuff including extra food, coke bottles, you name it. And then I had an Osprey Duro 6 hydration vest with a 2.5 liter bladder stuffed in it. The vest has lots of pockets and in addition to water I carried my hygiene and first aid kits as well as bars and gels, electrolyte tabs, and my bee free 1 liter soft flask and water filter. It also has a stretchy, meshy outer pouch that could expand to stash bigger, odd-shaped items when necessary. By the way, this is where my spot tracker lived, and it had great reception. Um, I think that about covers that. How much and what foods did you carry out of Silverton to get you to BV? And did you have to call ahead to Cathedral Cabins to get a spot, or just roll up? What if there isn't one available? So leaving Silverton, I probably carried about 6,000 calories, which was way more than adequate. I try to consume around 250 calories an hour on average, and I figured at the extremely slow end, it might take me 16 hours max to reach Cathedral. 
So that's roughly 4,000 calories and the extra 2,000 was just for variety since my stomach still wasn't loving everything and in case I got stuck overnight and couldn't make it to the cabins. In terms of types of food, I had trail mix, some SIS gels, goo powder for my water, some sesame treats, Nutella cookies, chocolate bars, and stuff like that. And as you can see from the video, I grabbed some gummy worms, peanut butter cups, a Luna bar, a bottle of Coke, and a couple bottles of chocolate milk from the grocery store as well. Again, I purposely wear the cycling jersey with pockets so I can stash drink bottles and random food in it. I did reach out to Cathedral Cabins that morning as I was leaving Silverton. Um, I was going the opposite way as the Grand Depart, so I knew they shouldn't be too busy yet, but I still wanted to reserve a cabin for some peace of mind. And it dangled a carrot for me to look forward to. Brad and Annette are the kindest folks you'll ever meet, and they definitely dot watch most of the time and know when to expect you. But even if it's the middle of the night or they're booked up, you can just roll up and set up a bivy or a tent. During the CTR, they also had a room that was open 24 hours for folks that just wanted to stop by and keep moving. It has Wi-Fi, you can warm up in there, there's a washer and dryer, so yeah, it's a great resource no matter what. And the resupply store is also open 24 hours, so you don't have to stress about making it there at a certain hour. I found it to definitely be a lifesaver for myself, and I know it was for a lot of other folks as well. I'm curious about your nutrition and hydration. What drinks are you drinking? I think I mostly answered this one already. Um, for food, just a variety of snacks. I try to keep munching as much as possible on the bike when the terrain allows or when I'm pushing the bike or stopping for any reason. When I'm passing through towns, I'm trying to eat big meals whenever I can. Pizza, salads, hearty sandwiches, baskets of fries, whatever the heck my body's craving. And I'll usually order extra food to go. Here's an example of a big breakfast that I had in Leadville. Uh, huevos rancheros with an avocado on top and some home fries with refried beans and a second plate of French toast with powdered sugar, butter and syrup and a side of fruit. Later that day I arrived at Copper Mountain where I had a chicken parm sandwich and a Caesar salad. At Cathedral Ranch I cooked top ramen with tuna and then I had an ice cream bar and a couple string cheeses. You get the point, it's just eating anything and everything you can. As far as hydration goes, I had three and a half liters of total water capacity between my two and a half liter bladder and a one liter soft flask. Sometimes I opted for plain water and other times I'd mix in carb or electrolyte powder, but at resupplies in restaurants, I'd usually drink a lot of Coke or lemonade. And as you already saw, I'd often take bottles of Coke or chocolate milk or vitamin water with me. Um, sweetened iced tea was also a big one or sometimes even Gatorade if that's all I could find. If you're curious, even with all this eating and the sugary drinks, I always felt like I was behind the eight ball and still lost about four pounds during the race. What do you do about food storage with black bears in the neighborhood? Let me start off by saying I'm no expert at this, but I'll tell you what I don't do. I never sleep with food or anything that gives off a scent anywhere near me, and I make sure to go pee somewhere far away before laying down to sleep. Obviously, if I'm at a legit campground, I'll use a bear box whenever possible, Pit toilets make a good stash spot too. Honestly, most of the time, I'm more worried about smaller critters like squirrels and mice snooping around and getting into my stash than I am of a bear. Hard-sided canisters like bear vaults that hikers use aren't super practical for bikepack racing, but maybe for touring. Sometimes I'll hang food, but there's varying opinions about the effectiveness of this, and there's not always trees around. So yeah, I mainly focus on trying to scent-proof my stuff as much as possible, like keeping my toothbrush, toothpaste, food wrappers, trash, and any food that's open or not prepackaged uh, in Ziplocs. I'm a big fan of a lock sack bags, which are basically heavy-duty Ziplocs. And I also carry a spare plastic grocery bag to wrap up bigger items like pizza slices. Once everything's sealed up, I put it all in my frame bag and in my top tube bag, and then I zip those up, and I park my bike a good distance away from where I'm sleeping. I try to lean the bike on a tree or something if I can. Uh, this makes packing and unpacking easier, but I also rationalize that maybe if a bear does get into my stuff, they'll knock the bike over and startle themselves and run away. <laughs> Wishful thinking. If I can't fit all my food in my bike bags, sometimes I'll also hide stuff in the dry bag that my sleep kit was in and I'll dangle that off my handlebars. 
Luckily, knock on wood, so far I've never had an encounter and I hope it stays that way. But I do like this question and I am curious about what you all do, so let us know in the comments. Situations where experience has carried you through. Nothing specific, but in general, I think the confidence and patience that comes from experience makes everything doable. I firmly believe that patience is underrated in most situations. The hard times will always end, the rain will stop, the hike a bike will become rideable again, you'll reach a summit, the sun will come out, the wind stops, and you're gonna be rewarded with a glorious descent. Maybe experience helps you stay focused on the positive stuff which is healthy, instead of dwelling on the negative, which can be toxic. I've really appreciated all your content, but particularly transparency with your training and power numbers. You laid down some pretty quick times on both the Colorado Trail and AZT, but your power seems to be in the mere moral range. I mean this in a really good way, LOL. It seems like the pattern overall with some outliers is that people with raw speed aren't always proportionally fast in these events. I'm curious what you would say are the most important aspects of racing that influence finish time as you seem to have those aspects really dialed. E.g. resupply, sleep, calories, mental, all of the above, etc. Thanks. That's a mouthful and a lot to cover. First off, thanks for your kind words. Secondly, I tend to think of myself as pretty slow, so it's nice that you think my times on the CTR and AZT were pretty quick. For anyone that's curious, my FTP was 264 at 155 pounds heading into the CTR this year, so definitely at the lower end of the mere mortal range. Anywho, power numbers and FTP are definitely not as important for bikepacking as, say, being a super diesel that can put out consistently strong zone 2 power for hour after hour and day after day. And even if you have the physical component, you need to be mentally committed as well, which is oftentimes more important. I also think of bikepacking efforts as races of cumulative efficiency. You've got to focus on being efficient with your energy expenditure, um, refueling and calorie intake, and being super efficient with your time off the bike. I think the best or fastest bikepacking racers have a combo platter of all these qualities. Ah, all right, here's a big one. Thanks for sharing your experience with us. I'm not religious myself, but I am really interested in the idea of spirituality, however that looks for different folks, bringing us strength in events like this. If you're comfortable sharing, I'd love to hear your general thoughts on any intersection of spirit and bike pack racing, like is it a major part of your experience or more in the background? Does it help keep you moving, change how you approach challenges, etc.? or also hear about specific instances of spiritual moments on the trail, thanks. Oh boy. <laughs> this is a heavy question. I wasn't expecting to go here, but I also don't wanna skirt it either. And I'm sure this will bother some of you, but that's okay. First off, yes, my gratitude and appreciation for my creator and all that I've been blessed with is a huge motivation and reason why I enjoy tackling bikepacking races. I'm just so thankful that God has given me a capable mind and body and time and financial resources and the will necessary to do these things. I know there's so many folks that don't have these opportunities for whatever reason. So for me, bikepacking is a way to spend time with God and honor and glorify him by reveling in these amazing experiences and his amazing creation. And just like in real life, I do lean on my faith to stay thankful through the most humbling and trying times out on the trail. As far as specific spiritual moments out there, there's too many to list, but I usually find myself the most vulnerable and emotional during sunrises. I like this one. Alan, why do you go on these rides alone? No one can hang with you? Perhaps that other YouTuber is free. <laughs> I ride with friends plenty, but I also enjoy riding alone. I like the solitude and the time for reflection, and it's definitely not because people can't hang with me. If anything, I'm scared of being the slowest one of my friends, and I don't like the pressure of feeling like I'm holding others back. As far as the other YouTuber, I'm not sure which one you're talking about, but I'm always game to ride with anybody. Thanks for your video and info. Now that you've had time to think about it, what were your roses and thorns? You got me. Uh, for roses, it was definitely time spent in fellowship with other riders and feeling the camaraderie. I left every interaction feeling invigorated with positive energy. 
A favorite piece of trail for me was the cottonwood section between Mount Princeton Hot Springs and Buena Vista. Last year the weather was gloomy and that section seemed to go on forever and ever. I was also in agonizing pain with a broken rib and it's where I made the decision to scratch. This year I was 100% healthy and the sun was smiling. It was flowy and fast and I carried momentum and floated through all the parts that crushed me last time, so that was a definite highlight. Another highlight was the Buffalo Creek single track on segment three, which had me smiling for hours. I definitely love to spend some time out there doing loops without a loaded bike. As far as lowlights, I haven't really thought about it. I prefer to think of lowlights as potential highlights that didn't quite make the cut. But I guess a thorn for me was the hike a bike section after Tank 7 Creek heading up to Marshall Pass. That one wrecked me two years in a row, and I just remember laughing to myself in a kind of delirious stupor while getting through it. And hindsight is 2020, so even though I know that was hard, and there were other bits that had to be super hard, I just look back on everything as roses now. How many miles ended up being hike a bike? This one's pretty hard to quantify exactly, but for fun and because I'm doing a long-term review on it, I wore an Ultra Human Ring Air. I was mainly interested in tracking sleep data, but it also tracks steps. According to the ring, I was averaging around 30 to 35,000 steps per day, and I even got up to 50,000 on my biggest day. If you calculate about 2,500 steps per mile, which is on the conservative end of approximate stride rates I found on Google, then I'd estimate 12 to 14 hours of strenuous hiking each day. How much elevation training, bare minimum, does it take for someone to tackle this route in seven to 10 days? There's no way to answer this objectively, obviously, since we're all at different fitness levels and respond differently to altitude, yada, yada, yada. As for me personally, I didn't get a chance to do specific elevation training ahead of time, and I still finished in under seven days with the conservative approach. I did strategically incorporate some heat workouts to my training, which I discussed in my pre-CTR video, and I feel these gave me some helpful adaptations leading up to the event. Unfortunately, I wound up traveling to North Carolina, working at sea level, and being completely off the bike for the week or so just before the race. So I probably didn't maximize those gains I worked so hard for. Anyway, you definitely can do the CT without any specific elevation training. Plenty of folks come straight from sea level. Just be prepared to go a lot slower for the first couple of days, especially if you're starting in Durango, um, and then you'll notice your body reacting better and not redlining as easy as you get more acclimated. But I'd also recommend considering starting in Denver, since the gradual rise is easier to cope with, as opposed to going straight from seven to 12,000 feet in 20 miles like you do on the Durango side. What was your finishing time? Were you happy with it? And how would you go faster? Okie dokes, my finishing time was six days, 20 hours, and 15 minutes. Yes, I was 100% happy with my finishing time and the ride as a whole. My goal was simply to finish the route, and although I was technically racing, I put much more weight on enjoying myself, hanging with other riders, and filming everything than strictly going fast. As for how I'd go faster, uh, <laughs> first, I'd start in the morning and get a full day of riding on the first day instead of doing my genius idea of a prologue beginning just before sunset and then bivvying a few hours later. That added an extra night of sleeping out, plus stop time setting up my shelter, etc., and that was all on the clock. It would have been way more efficient to spend that first night in a hotel off the clock and saving a handful of hours. Uh, besides that, I would increase my moving time and decrease my downtime, which I had plenty of. I was averaging more than 10 hours of stop time each day. I was chatting with a bunch of Grand Depart racers and random folks throughout the journey, and most of these conversations were for five to 10 minutes at least, and some were even half an hour or more. I was also sitting down in restaurants for nice meals, and I got seven to eight hours of sleep on multiple nights. I took four hotel rooms, and I stopped early at a couple of them when I could have easily pushed on riding for a few more hours. So without necessarily riding much faster or pushing myself too much deeper in the pain cave or sleep deprivation, I think I could easily trim off some hours. Heck, in a perfect world, I'd also get to Colorado a couple weeks early and pre-ride some of the route and help get acclimated. Another thing I do a bunch more is dedicated hiking training beforehand. 
There's a ton of time to be made up by improving your hiking efficiency on this route, and it's easy to overlook. I mean, think about it. If you're hiking at, say, 1.8 miles an hour instead of 1.5 miles an hour over the course of the whole route, there's some decent gains to be made there. Any gear fails. Luckily, nothing too bad. In the ride video, I mentioned ripping my dry bag on the first night, but I fixed that with duct tape and it held up for the rest of the ride. The only other gear-related issue I can think of is with my B-Free water filter. After a couple days, it started clogging up and the flow was painfully slow no matter how much I tried to shake it up, swirl it, clean it, whatever. It was annoying enough that I started using purification tabs instead. This is the second time it's happened to me with this filter, which is such a bummer because I really love it when it's working well. How was the new upper section of the Fuses Trail? Fantastic. It seems like it adds maybe a mile or so, but for those who I asked about climbing it, they all said it's more enjoyable than the death march it replaced. I got to descend it, and instead of a sketchy, washed out, fall line brake burner, it's now fast and flowy and super fun, just like the lower section. How has your post-race recovery been? Any nagging injuries or issues? Honestly, this was the best I've ever felt after a bikepacking race. I went into it with some solid fitness, rode a conservative pace, and got plenty of sleep. And I took a bunch of showers and kept good hygiene. No nerve issues, my hands and contact points felt great, no saddle sores. Other than my taste buds being a little sensitive post-race, no issues at all. I had a nice 20 mile recovery ride in Littleton the day after finishing, and then pretty much just jumped on a plane and went back to North Carolina for work, and my coworkers really had no clue what I just endured. In fact, if I didn't make a video to prove it, I might not even believe I did the CTR. That's how good I felt. All right, that's it. Those are my answers to some of your most asked questions. Maybe some of this stuff will help you with planning your next adventure on the Colorado Trail or elsewhere. If you did find merit in this video, please give it a like. And if you have any more questions or you want me to elaborate on anything specifically, let me know down in the comment section. Otherwise, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward. Thanks so much for squeezing dirty teeth into your busy schedule. Please help us reach more people and ensure you receive new videos by giving this video a like, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell. Until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward.